Good morning, dear colleagues. I would like uh, to ask, uh, I mean, I'm really sorry for this bad voice. Actually, I, when I got uh, up today, I realized that I lost my voice. I will try my best so as to uh, keep the discussion uh, into this session. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, very much for your kind attendance into this session. Uh, I'm Harris Kondoes. I'm uh, the chair of the session. The co-chair is Ms. Alexia Tsuni, a close collaborator to us. And uh, this is the session relating to disasters and health. Um, maybe several of you have attended the meeting of yesterday, the preparatory meeting of the action group. It was indeed a crowded and very interesting discussion uh, uh, we had yesterday. Uh, we actually try to highlight, I mean, what is the potential through the Eurogeo and to the uh, actions of these groups, actually one being the Disaster and Health Action Group, uh, similar to several others that uh, we are running in the framework of the Eurogeo initiative. The main scope is that um, Eurogeo is trying to empower uh, actually the use of earth observation data towards the development of services, the engagement of users, and uh, the uh, uh, translation of uh, data and research into significant knowledge and um, uh, services for the benefit of the end users. But when we say end user, we need not I mean just the abstracted idea of the user, but the user who is actually needing the data takes the information and use it into its uh, daily practice. And this is the big challenge uh, we have in the Eurogeo since its uh, uh, early days, four or five years ago, and we would like to keep this concept sustained uh, to the extent possible for the next uh, year. So the role of the Eurogeo action groups is exactly this, that we stimulate the discussion, we stimulate the exchange in between the different actors, scientists, service providers, stakeholders, uh, users, um, data providers, um, so as to, uh, as, a, as a community actually, as an action group, provide something useful and sustainable for the future. And one of the main aspects that we would like to discuss today is how you think this Eurogeo initiative is going to support your action, what you are expecting uh, from Eurogeo uh, so as to uh, make your uh, action sustainable and uh, how do you think, how do you think that this uh, next phase of Eurogeo uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, could be a better coordinated so as to achieve uh, these goals. So this is a very short introduction. We will have the opportunity to speak, uh, I mean, on all this, I mean, later in the discussion uh, part of the session. Now I would like to pass directly and give the floor to the first speaker of the day, uh, which is <coughs> Marco Folegani from Mio. Marco actually has um, um, uh, actually been part of the previous uh, is safe project that uh, uh, it was uh, run uh, under the Eurogeo initiative. Uh, Marco, actually, I remember you were not from the very early days of ESAPE, but you joined ESAPE later on. And, uh, and even it had been in ESAPE for only two years, I think, before it was closed, you did a very good uh, progress. And please take the floor and explain to us what was your action in, your, in the ESAPE project. Thank you very much. Uh, please, I have to remind to everyone that it is seven talk presentation. Okay. Uh, seven, sorry, seven minute presentation in order to have some uh, room for talks. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. Assessment through automatic change detection of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 Sentinel uh, images. The, the domain of the project is uh, disaster management, but uh, disaster management intended as a, a disaster occurring in those remote areas that can count on a consolidated and a robust infrastructure where extreme events with, uh, also with limited magnitude can have a, a devastating impact. While other extreme events uh, occurring in, uh, uh, let's say, in area with a good infrastructure can have uh, limited impact. 
The, so the scope of uh, FRIEND is to provide uh, uh, tools for uh, impact uh, assessment analysis and uh, risk estimation in a flood event. The consortium uh, of this pilot is made of uh, MEO, the company I'm re here uh, representing. It is uh, an Italian company operating since uh, 2004. Uh, in the field of earth observation and uh, we have been supporting this uh, project by Sachen, European Union Satellite Center uh, for analysis uh, uh, and decision, uh, decision making. But uh, let's see the talk a little about uh, uh, the, the rationale of uh, this project. This project is, uh, this pilot is a demonstration of um, mm, how data uh, combined with good data and uh, robust data uh, combined with technology can support uh, the decision making by providing uh, information organized in scenario. Okay, uh, the logic of uh, the service is quite simple. Uh, the, the service provides uh, uh, analysis, identification, uh, selection, and filtering uh, tool of uh, data sets that uh, can uh, be uh, then elaborated to, uh, to produce uh, the uh, information product needed by the user. The service is addressed to two kinds of uh, users, a generic user with uh, no expertise, no skill in uh, earth observation data, uh, which uh, is required to provide uh, requirements in terms of uh, area, period, and uh, parameters, or uh, let's say domain uh, that uh, is needed to monitor. Then, uh, based on this requirement, uh, uh, the service uh, take care uh, of collecting, identifying, collecting, uh, filtering the right data set, uh, the right data that can be useful for the specific uh, requirement, specific problem provided by the generic user. Then uh, the data are further elaborated and the results are returned to uh, the, the user, the generic user, uh, for uh, approval, for uh, review. But the service is also addressed to another kind of uh, another category of user, uh, which is the expert user that uh, doesn't need uh, support in analysis identification of data set because he knows very well uh, the data, but uh, it can count on uh, the elaboration and the uh, monitoring service provided by the service. So uh, in this way, we want to address, uh, uh, let's say, a large uh, audience uh, uh, with expert and no expert uh, uh, use, earth observation data users. But let's see uh, the, um, <clears throat> the pilot, uh, the, the project. This is uh, the, the landing page. The landing page, uh, of the service uh, provides uh, uh, information about uh, the, the tool, about uh, the project behind uh, uh, the, the tool. Uh, also, it provides a tutorial, video tutorial to explain how to, to access and how to use uh, the service. And of course, the, the, uh, <coughs> the, the two ways to access uh, the service, uh, which are uh, for uh, no, no expert user, which means a graphic user interface that allows the interaction with the data, uh, with, this, uh, with the tools, uh, and uh, uh, the, <clears throat> the service for expert users, which is basically a Jupyter Lab, where uh, there are uh, um, tutorial uh, examples, uh, uh, guidelines uh, for exploiting the data collected uh, and exposed by the tool uh, through the APIs. Let's have a look at the uh, graphic user interface for no expert user. Uh, this is uh, uh, basically uh, uh, how <coughs> the, the service expose uh, the, uh, the data. In, uh, on, the, on the top left, uh, we uh, have the list of use cases uh, already uh, currently implemented in, uh, in the project, uh, which um, uh, means that uh, you can surf through the use cases, uh, uh, see the uh, basic information about uh, the events that uh, have been uh, considered, and uh, the area of interest and uh, the period. 
the service is organized in uh, use cases because uh, uh, then we will see later on uh, we want to avoid a general purpose we want to be specific for the requirements uh, of the users then on uh, the bottom left uh, we have the list of data sets available for the specific use case which means that changing use case uh, we will have uh, a completely different list of data sets because as i said before uh, this is uh, the data set are customized on the specific requirement of the use case and the, the, the end user the data sets are organized in two groups the first is about uh, the risk estimation which means that uh, we are exposing we are uh, sharing when making available uh, the basically the copernicus product uh, concerning the flood risk which means uh, uh, precipitation uh, <clears throat> And the other uh, and the other uh, products uh, that uh, uh, as you know uh, can be must be updated on a regular basis since copernicus is providing new products uh, uh, let's say on quarterly basis or uh, <clears throat> every six months then we have the second group of data sets which uh, concerns uh, the impact assessment. Basically, uh, these data sets are uh, products uh, generated from uh, analysis of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, change detection, uh, elaborated together. Here in this uh, tool, you, you can uh, upload, you can visualize in the main window the products in terms of raster or in terms of uh, time series. You can consult, you can uh, compare the events, we can compare the data, you, you can download uh, the data. Then we have uh, the, uh, the expert uh, user interface, which is basically uh, a Jupyter Lab. Here in the example, uh, we reported the code to, uh, uh, to generate, to retrieve the same image uh, exposed in uh, uh, the previous slide. To conclude, uh, lessons learned and uh, fruit evolution about uh, this uh, pilot friend allows us to uh, add value or existing product uh, by aggregating other products, which means that uh, the added value from my point of view is the combination of uh, different uh, kind of uh, data sets, uh, observation, uh, prediction, risk uh, products uh, that can be combined together by uh, following a thematic uh, approach. Uh, the two uh, the, the two way to access the uh, the data sets uh, allow to reach a, a larger uh, audience uh, for all concerns the evolution uh, we want to add other uh, case studies which means uh, other selection of uh, data sets we want to integrate uh, with existing uh, services, uh, but we will want also to update uh, the, uh, the list of data sets with the new Copernicus uh, uh, product. Here, a uh, few links. Uh, if you want to see the user guide, uh, explore the platform, and see the video tutorial. Thank you. Seven minutes. Good. Okay. The next presentation is Alexia Masakatsi. Actually, Alexia is not present today uh, physically, but uh, she should be connected uh, virtually with us. Uh, could you please check? <coughs> Alexia is also uh, a use case and pilot action which uh, was interpreted in the ESA project uh, uh, <coughs> through the onboarding process. So, Alexia is also uh, an action that was developing such uh, uh, services, so called mobile use uh, uh, service that is being um, uh, uh, advanced in the development of Unity using the mechanism of Unity and that's a new intelligent co design and co creation that the gets of the new users of Unity. Uh, but I'll give the floor to Alexia to explain a bit better that uh, this has been done in the terms of the, the, the each safe user geo project, project and how this has helped her to uh, make uh, uh, her action uh, more visible to the, the, the community of users. Can we have a okay, please, Alexia, take the Thank you. Thank you very much, Harris. Can you can you hear me okay? 
Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, first of all, my uh, my apologies for not being with you today in beautiful uh, Bolzano. Uh, I wish I wish I could have been there. Um, right. So, uh, mountain now. Um, well, maybe you know uh, the the uh, the starting point of the story would be to um, to try to understand why, in fact, the the idea uh, came about. So, the market need. That we're trying to uh, to address, and the idea, in fact, is very simple. I mean, myself, I happen to be a, um, a mountaineer, and climate change, as as many as many of you, has always been on my horizon in 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 many ways. So, in fact, I realized that uh, real time geolocalized information um, about hazards in the outdoor and in the mountains, particularly uh, where it's still extremely hard to get. And that um, in the end, people like you and I going hiking or skiing or were actually missing information about what they what, what they were going to find. You know, if you go hi hiking in the spring and and you have no idea whether the amount of snow that you you may you may uh, uh, come across, or if you have to cross a bridge and you don't know you know what state it is and so on. So there are major safety issues um, involved. And if you are a, a national park, for instance. It's, it's in fact very surprising to see uh, how much um, local and, and, and geospatial information and, and precise information those um, public and private actors are actually missing in order to make their, their management uh, more um, efficient. So at the end of the day, this has um, a major impact on, on lives. And in fact, the, the overall uh, outdoor tourism and in insurance industry um, as a whole. So the, the unique value proposition that we put together, and I should mention from up front that the, the, first, the first thing we did was to uh, work um, with uh, Alpine clubs, with um, safety bodies in the, in, the, in the mountain world. The last thing we wanted was to reinvent the wheel. So there was a, a real uh, co-design and, and user-driven um, approach uh, that really at the very, uh, um, uh, at the origin basically of, of mountain now uh, story. So what, the, what is the UVP about? Well, crowdsourcing is, is truly integral um, uh, to uh, to the tool, the idea. In fact, the beauty of it is that if if only um, you know a few percent of the of all the people going to the mountains for for leisure, basically, take take a picture, make a comment here and there. It doesn't have to be all the time. It just it just you know it just be obviously it depends on what you come across as well in terms of potential hazards or not. Um, but uh, if if you get those people to share and through the tool you can do that in real time in a few in a few seconds, then it makes a huge difference. So it, it also takes you to, to the real time dimension, which in the mountain uh, realm was was non-existent. Um, hazards location we have combined with over the years we are, and this is something we've been able to do within eShape uh, as well to really improve to com to combine crowdsourced data together with satellite-based data, so essentially Sentinel um, one and two data telling you about the, the latest uh, snow uh, conditions all over the Alpine region, and that's in, in collaboration with, with Exolabs. So on a daily basis, you can really see the, the latest info um, and uh, get the exact number, uh, at least the, as evaluated through the, the, the uh, the algorithms uh, in centimeter, how much of snow you're going to to come across. At the same time, I mentioned the end user being you and I going to the mountains, but at the same time, we are building a unique database uh, about the Alps in terms of how it's changing in the context of climate change, how glaciers are, are changing, for instance, and that we are um, putting at the service of, of research. I'll get back to that in a, in a few uh, seconds. At the same time, this gives us the opportunity to uh, compile uh, all of this data uh, uh, is actually structured and organized in a way that just by the push of a button, you can you can compile all the avalanches, for instance, of the last winter, all the landslides and so on. So in terms of, of, of big data analysis, we are also uh, we have also um, uh, plans in these uh, and activities in the in that direction. 
We also use navigation. We also complement all of those features with navigation uh, uh, capabilities, um, multilingual for seasons. The idea, since as we know, seasons are, are, are changing quite a bit. Uh, Mountain now um, has to be a tool that can be used on any day. Um, and um, so this, this is to give you an idea of the, of the traction that we have uh, to date. So we've been operational in our very first version, of course, since since 2017, the, the application has been changing a lot. But we have about 30,000 uh, users plus in, in Europe with um, over 20,000 tracks and observations already shared on the platform. The proof of technology has been successfully tested. Uh, so I mentioned the Alps, but in fact, you can use Melton now anywhere in the world. The, you get open um, open base map uh, as as the, um, as the as the main map, regardless of where you go. So it's actually very very helpful as as a reference uh, and and um, and also giving an indication of the potential for expanding mountain now to other mountain ranges in the world. From the very beginning, we've been working with authoritative organizations. Um, which is a part of our strategy. I'll get back to that. Four languages, and uh, at, until now, the apps are free, um, uh, free on 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 the app stores and the web uh, for the user uh, completely. For us, it has been a priority uh, until yeah. now. So eShape, Harris mentioned eShape, and and we've had a fantastic uh, experience in the context of that project, and and this also gave us the the, the opportunity to develop some new premium features. That are opening the way to, in fact, um, having a premium version of the of the application at the same time as the as the basic um, free version. And uh, just to give you an idea of those features, we have now introduced new satellite-based products. Uh, and until now, we had the current status of the of the snow depth. Now we have introduced two-day forecasts, which are which makes a key difference uh, for people wanting to go um, uh, and planning their trips in in the mountains. In terms of, of safety and and fun, uh, in terms of filtering, also for inspiration or for trying to find the in the uh, filtering on the on the various icons, um, you can uh, now the uh, do that extremely efficiently and rapidly through the application. Also, live comments have been have been improved. Uh, also, the maps can be. Uh, can be uh, and the information on tracks, hazards, uh, observations can be saved offline, so you don't need the network anymore to do that. So all these we've been um, we've been developing and are uh, now ready for the uh, for the upcoming winter, which we are very excited um, about. Strategic partnerships for us have been from the very beginning, and, and eShape is 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 certainly uh, also uh, a, a, a very high profile partner that we that we've had in terms of project. Um, but we've been working with, uh, as I mentioned, alpine clubs, safety bodies, uh, national mapping um, agencies, but also uh, sports brands, commercial brands. Uh, tourist tourism offices, uh, national parks, uh, research labs, and so on. So it's really a whole ecosystem, in fact, of partners that we've been developing that have been all helping in their own ways in um, giving us visibility and, and uh, also promoting uh, the tool. In, um, in 2021, we started a collaboration in the context of a, of a GCOS uh, a Switzerland Meteo Swiss uh, project with the the, the, nas the Swiss National Monitoring Systems for glaciers and permafrost to actually collect observations for for them over the summer. So basically, it would relate to you're probably familiar with the issue of the uh, the, the, the rising issue of the glacial lakes and and the, the kind of time bombs that they represent more and more the the seracs the the uh, the rock falls. Um, and and the, the the overall glacier melting, of course, which is accelerating. Um, uh, every well, which we find uh, as accelerating every um, every summer. Uh, the, the, I wanted to mention that the as many of the of the applications that, that that are being shown. I mean, there is always potential for expanding, and in the case of Mountain Now, in fact, we we tend to refer to uh, the whole approach, the infrastructure that we have been developing as as now together as a whole, because the potential to expand to uh, to the seas, to uh, to the desert, to the forest, in fact, is extremely high and easy. In fact, you just need to adjust the the various icons that we. we Alexia, use. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting yeah. you. But we have, I mean, uh, you need close to, to, to Okay, to, sure. To I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, and I'll uh, I'll just stop on on the love this very last last slide. To this is my last slide anyway. Um, to say that within eShape, in fact, we've been exploring this in connection with cultural heritage, together with Ersk and uh, the Selen the Selun Selenunte, uh, sorry, uh, park in in Sicily. Last stop there. Thank you very much. The next presentation is uh, given by Professor Marco Mancini from Politecnico di Milano. Marco, the floor is yours. I have to uh, <coughs> highlight to um, this audience here that uh, the action group is actually a voluntary, a voluntary action. Okay, it's not at all the uh, projects or I mean actions that you are going to uh, we are going to be presented today have been part of the previous ESAP or, or I mean. Eurogy of funding uh, instrument. For example, Marco Mancini is working in the action group on a voluntary basis. And please, Marco, the floor is yours to explain us what has been done. I mean, how this Eurogy action group has helped you. Thank you. Thank you, Eris. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to report here in a, in a, what I think is a nice experience, a nice case study that came from the synergy of a municipality, so a real end use, a civil protection people of a municipality in Lombardia. The group of operational engineering company that was a spin off from Polytechnic of Milano, that has MMI, and the group of research at PolyMe. The issue was to uh, set up in a, a, in a synergy with the engineering solution an early warning system that allow to allow to forecast in real time a possible over flow over this uh, over the rivers coming through Milano this is the Milano area and uh, of course uh, the synergy with the land observation from satellite is very intrinsic because uh, the filters that uh, we use to um, to tune the, the process uh, is a, a hydrological water balance model that works at the pixel scale and it is fitted also by remote sensing data. Let me give you, wait a second, I think it doesn't work. May you go to, to the next slide? What is in the next slide uh, is that uh, I try to give an, uh, uh, wait a second. No, it's the next one. The, the, the third one. Or the third one. Or the third one. The third one. It's uh, not this one. No, this is not mine. You have to go further. Uh, this is. It's called Mancini for Suozano. Mancini for Suozano. I know I recently want to, to, to close for that. To keep the time, but thank you. I, I'm really glad to Evis and Alexia to push me to be here. <laughs> no, okay, okay, okay. And uh, what is the meaning of this? Uh, grazie, questa oh, And what is the meaning of this type of systems? Of course, uh, is uh, to contribute. Uh, let me. No, wait a second. Uh, do you have do you have the pointer? Yeah, is to contribute to the reduction of flood risk, not only in a synergic way with the structural hydraulic structures. Try to don't because the structures reduce the hazard of a flooding, but and the, the early warning systems contribute to the reduce the vulnerability of territory because you may activate in advance civil protection protective actions so this is the scope and uh, you have to realize that in our dense and ancient territory use of large hydraulic structures sometimes needed to prevent the hazard of floodings are not well accepted by the social by the sociality, by the people, because this so hydraulic issue is always a not well posed problem from a social point of view. Because due to the gravity, I always come to pick the, gra the garden of someone upstream to defend some other ones downstream, so that we cannot escape 
from the structures, but we can tune the sites of structures according with the management of the residual risk. And this may be done using the uh, early warning system. I like to put your two attention, that is actually not a new thing, it is in, this is a, a sentence from 86 from uh, uh, Nemec, not to keep the water away from the people, but the people away from the waters is the meaning of this type of early warning stuff. What you can notice, this is the problem in Milan, okay, where uh, the urbanization since uh, the 1954 to nowadays has changed in a considerable way the flood, the land use. Uh, and uh, you may see that uh, a, a discharge that were that had a frequency of hundred return periods nowadays has a frequency of about fifty return periods. So it becomes more frequency. Look at the angle. Look at the angle of this runoff production curves. So this is not may be given to climatic change that can be contributed, but this is mainly given to the drastically change in the land use. And when we're talking about land use, we're not talking about only the runoff coefficient that intuitives can change, but also about the connection of the, the in the routing phase in the transport of runoff due to the drainage system built in the, in the area. So how the system works to be very close, to be very fast, we filter meteorological forecast in a, a pixel-wise hydrological models to get the uh, uh, discharge hydrograph in any of this uh, dot point, the green point in this uh, uh, area. These are the rivers coming into, into Milan. Milan, uh, there is a lot, those the rivers were mainly all diverted by the Romans. So now we have a problem because the, the urbanization grew up. And so the idea is to, um, have the, to have discharge that are more or less dangerous according to the over, la, over, overflow of, of this threshold. This is a threshold, this is the Seveso River, this one coming into Milano. And this is uh, made with the procedures. So, how the things work at the end. It's a filter, as I say, of several meteorological models. And this is a point. Uh, to use not one meteorological forecast, but the several meteorological forecasts, because there is no time. Any of these meteorological forecasts has different uh, ahead time, different resolution in time, different resolution in space, so that you may have uh, different uh, forecasts, but uh, you may then uh, choose or given a probability of a flood arriving a day or two days before in a given cross section. And this is uh, supported by a local monitoring. This is the river savers, of course, uh, in a, a, a dry moment, but uh, uh, where we installed uh, also things uh, uh, in um, our instruments to control that. This you can get, oh, I'm sorry, you can get under the sol.polymy.it that is uh, a, uh, the website where you can find. These are the, this is another interesting, in, in this framework, there is, a, I want to also stress a nice interesting solution, a nice interesting case that is the collaboration between uh, institutional data and the citizen science staff. There is, a, because you may see here that the yellow points, the yellow points increase a lot the density of rain gauges on the territory. This is the Seveso River, which I long, I, I'm, I'm speaking about. This is the Milano town. And then you, we may increase a lot the institutional data with uh, the citizen side data that are not, not, they have not the same accuracy as uh, the international one, but the accuracy from the citizen data are sufficient for our hydrologic models. So this is also a point that I would stress. And then let me give you, uh, I think I have to close, right? Uh, uh, okay, just I won't give, what is the best, when we use all these kind of models, what is the error given by the meteorological forecast? What is the error given by uh, uh, hydrological modeling? And as you see here, the error given by the meteor, uh, meteor forecast may be quite still significant. So in a, if we have to choose a configuration, we have to choose to prefer system that minimizes uh, false uh, or missed alarms, DPR. I think we have to minimize this one, that is the number of success, successful forecasts on the all observed 
uh, 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 information. And uh, I fly. So, and I have to say one other thing that uh, sometimes uh, we, we are also discussing about what type of precipitation produce more errors on the forecast, or if it is a stratiform, if it is convective. There is no time I will love to this. Just to finish uh, this, uh, my, I, would have, I have here some points. I think this warning system may really help in reducing flood risk in, in this is synergic with our structures it helps in mean in reducing the size of structures that means also the maintenance of hydraulic structures i am a civil engineering so i i like i love hydraulic structures but i have to say that we have to manage their size so i think we can uh, say thank you to every, every everyone and came safe to milano i would say Thank you, dear Marco. Thank you very much. Um, the next presentation is given by me, I think. Okay, it's about the uh, early warning system for mosquito-borne diseases. This is the AWA system. I have to tell you that uh, when we started, I mean, this uh, the development of this system, it was completely on a voluntary basis. Action done, uh, uh, 18 partners from Europe. We started under the brand name, if I may use this, uh, term of Eurogeo to develop this activity. There was not any, any funding at the time. We have been uh, with actually working together, 18 partners, uh, uh, key institutions from Europe for at least three years until we uh, have this system to be fully operational and applicable first to Europe and now I mean in other countries outside Europe. The AOA system is the uh, early warning system for mosquito-borne diseases. Uh, can you please? Oh, no, it's me. Okay, it's actually the system that it is <clears throat> uh, developed uh, in the fight against uh, uh, um, climate change. It used uh, health uh, problems relating to mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases like malaria, West Nile virus, dengue fever, yellow fever, depending on the country, the system it is applicable. I'm sure you know that these type of diseases are the more lethal diseases in almost everywhere in the world. Uh, according to the official figures, 700,000 deaths per year they are uh, caused because of this type of diseases. Sorry. And uh, what the AOA system actually does, uh, it's uh, providing early enough, I mean, uh, a month or two weeks before, to the official and to the institutional authorities information about the expected entomological and epidemiological risk at the level of the region, at the level of the municipality, or even at the level of the settlement, so as to anticipate uh, early warning um, uh, actions, door-to-door -door actions, and at the same time, of course, actions for the um, uh, fight and uh, against them spraying, etc. All of this, what is needed for the uh, um, uh, suppression of this type of, um, of, um, of risk. Uh, what have been the achievements? Uh, the achievement uh, is that uh, we through, through the AOA system, because I have to tell you that when we started developing this system, we had realized that there were many different uh, um, actions uh, uh, worldwide, but uh, they were uh, very site specific. It was not possible to have a system that could be scalable and transferable from area to area. And this was one of the main objectives of the, of the, of the group when we started to develop the EPA system. The other main objective was that we should create uh, data repositories, and we do have today uh, centralized data repositories with many different types of data, entomological data, health data, landscape data, climatic data, etc. All of them in a rather harmonized way. And we have created big feature spaces already for the last at least uh, uh, 10 or even more, ye more years uh, in the areas that the system has been uh, uh, implemented uh, so that uh, this Feature spaces are actually could be considered as benchmark data sets for the scientists that they want to base upon their developments or modeling actions. And this is very important because before we, we were suffering from silo data spaces and of different quality and different accuracies. And last but not least, uh, uh, today uh, the system is supporting 11 regions in Europe. 
uh, actually 11,000 municipalities where 34 million people uh, living there. Uh, we have also one operational uh, implementation of the system in uh, Ivory Coast in a region with 4.7 million Euro, uh, people. And, um, uh, and uh, I mean, on this uh, um, timeline, you see that we started with two European countries, Greece and Italy, uh, trying to confront the problem of West Nile virus. In 2021, we expanded to France, Germany, Greece, Italy, and Serbia. In 2022, we included uh, Ivory Coast and Thailand, and that was uh, that was the first time that we have received in 2002 uh, some financial support from uh, the ESAP Eurogeo um, um, program. Since then, it was a voluntary action. And uh, in, from last year, from last uh, Eurogeo workshop until today, in one year, we have been expanding our action in Ghana in eastern Germany, so we have included more regions in Germany, one more region in Italy, which is close to Milan area, and we are discussing with Pasteur Institute uh, network, actually, so as to expand the action into uh, member states of the Pasteur network. And uh, in the last year, um, uh, we have uh, progressed so, to, so as to advance further our models, uh, entomological and epidemiological model. Now the model is um, able, uh, I mean it's an artificial intelligence, big data analysis model that it is now addressing the problem <coughs> uh, the, um, of entomological and epidemiological risk in different scales. Uh, that is from the scale of the region to municipality to settlement, but even to the level of the trap, so we can predict the expected risk at the level of the trap, so as to, I mean, for the authorities, the control authorities to anticipate, I mean, how they are going to, um, uh, to locate the traps in the area, which is, uh, I mean, supposed to be under risk, but also at the level of the, of the settlement, so as to uh, support door-to-door uh, -door aware actions. Uh, in terms of engagement, I mentioned already that uh, the last year the, uh, the discussions and the MOUs have been expanded so as to include uh, stakeholders from Latin America. We are in um, further discussions with the uh, uh, Inter-American Development Bank uh, so as to export the action into that area. Uh, the fact is that because a lot of the action is based on the use of earth observation data and uh, having there, I mean, some local partner providing us in situ entomological or health data, the scalability of the models allow us to expand the action into other, I mean, non-European countries. And that was one of the main concerns uh, when we started developing the system uh, in the framework of the Eurogeo. Uh, at the same time, the JRC uh, has uh, assigned an MOU in this year so as to expand the research for West Nile virus in Greece uh, by uh, expanding the research actually uh, using uh, and how the different environmental and not only environmental factors but also uh, mobility factors can uh, be uh, used in our models uh, for uh, making I mean, the assessment of the risks uh, uh, more accurate. Uh, um, financial sustainability, uh, as I have to tell you that uh, we are very uh, happy to have received in, in the meantime uh, the award of the European Innovation Council of the, uh, for, I mean, that was a big support into our action and uh, which is uh, used today so as to invest further into the developments and the expanding of the action in other territories outside Europe and is has expressed a strong interest. It was presented for the first time, the action last year in the collaborative ground segment of European Space Agency. Uh, and it is a strong interest uh, expressed by ESA so as to uh, integrate this as one of the um, advanced applications of the Destination Earth platform developed uh, by the European Space Agency. Last but not least, the dissemination and communication, because we, we, we all um, all members of the action groups actually in Eurogeo, we should continue disseminating, communicating our activities and making it visible uh, to not only to European audiences, but outside Europe as well. Uh, the, this, the, the AOA system uh, has been um, 
um, actually uh, presented, uh, we received an invitation by Geo Secretariat at WMO so as to include it into the Geo Highlight Report of 2023 and the Climate Change World Meteorological Organization report that were, were two highlight communication actions of this uh, year, of the last year of our developments, uh, while I mean, with the support of the European Commission, have been participating in EGU, Geo for Health, and uh, Geo Week. Um, uh, meetings and uh, this year actually again it's going to be the Geo Week um, event of Cape Town last year in um, in Ghana where we initiated the discussions with Ghana colleagues uh, that uh, have been have concluded today uh, to uh, go with a new MOU with them and expanding of our action into their territories. Um, that is, and if you ask me, and I close with this uh, slide, if you ask me about uh, what we further expect from this action group and from the Eurogeo initiative is to receive the support and the support into, in the coordination of the action, uh, the coordination of the EWA um, ecosystem under the flag of Eurogeo so as to make it more visible into entrusted authorities and to the extent possible influence uh, the uh, strategic and political decisions uh, for receiving further support as action group towards the development of the actions in the European and, non, uh, and outside uh, Europe territories. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Okay the, the, okay, the next presentation is from Mr. William Wind. Um, uh, you are going to give a presentation about a new uh, project. Correct. All right. Yeah. The EU for a warning. Indeed. Um, good morning. I'm actually presenting on behalf of the project coordinator, uh, Fede Bartimaeus, out of Barcelona. I'm William Wint, uh, based in Oxford. This is another of the projects on the sort of thing that Harris has been talking about, in other words, mosquito-borne diseases which are now becoming a threat to Europe. Uh, oh, yes, it works. Congratulations. Um, we're in a hurry, so I'm going to miss the fluff. Um, essentially, we are trying to look at these things in the One Health context, uh, with <clears throat> using, of course, uh, Earth observation to provide a lot of the data. So we're looking at disease reservoirs, the vectors, i.e. the mosquitoes that carry the diseases, the humans and the environment and the disease levels themselves. The basic logic um, is that dengue, which is the disease we're primarily dealing with, uh, looks likely to establish and spread here in Europe. Um, as it's not yet widely established here, though, it's a bit difficult to study it. So essentially what we have to do is to use what we know about dengue in other areas and extrapolate it to what is likely to go on here. And to do that, we do a number of things. Um, we're looking at dynamic disease models um, and forecasting tools in a number of endemic areas, as I've just mentioned, and extending those specific dynamic disease models uh, to several identified hotspots outside Europe. Um, and those hotspots are, are essentially identified to be the ones that are important to import the disease here. Uh, the climate information and probably the vegetation information used in these models is provided by Earth Observation. We're also using Earth Observation and novel vector sampling, uh, groovy traps and automated traps and citizen science. All of these things are a bit on the edge as far as uh, mosquito sampling is concerned to look at vector and host distribution models at different scales. So we understand what's going on at different scales. We're looking at also how it might spread once it gets here. Um, by looking at spillover from natural areas, which is one possibility, and also uh, looking at spread in and between urban areas. Again, some of the drivers that we use as, as input to these models are provided by uh, EO. Um, and then we're looking at import levels and how much it's likely to come in here before and if it starts spreading. Again, some of those drivers are going to be, uh, of spread is going to be um, EO stuff. I'll forget that. We don't need that. So I'm going to quickly look at some of the highlights. Uh, let's look at the urban environments I mentioned. Uh, the, as I've mentioned before, the driver information to predict vector presence, i.e. mosquito presence, 
what it does, the seasonal abundance, its activity, how it interacts with people, and how it disperses, the vectors disperse, often driven by um, climatological data, which is, some of which is provided by Earth observation. But also we need to know about human mobility, human activities. We need to catch them in ways that aren't too labor intensive. So we've got automatic traps to do that. Um, but we combine that with traditional uh, surveillance and citizen science, which allows us to test these methods against each other to see which we can uh, use best. As I said, we're looking at spillover from wetlands into peri-urban areas, uh, looking specifically at um, Aedes, the tiger mosquito Aedes albopictus uh, in Europe in a number of different areas. Um, and we're also, uh, while we're at it, looking at an another mosquito which is uh, implicated in West Nile virus spread, as Harris would have told you. We use mark and release recapture. Uh, we need to know the habitat, again, helped by Earth observation. We use biologging. We look at the way the birds move around because they're important for the mosquitoes. And that gives us an idea of how the vectors disperse, where their, their, the host and vector home ranges are, um, how the vectors uh, are active and how they interact with the people and so on. Good. Oh, sorry. Um, we obviously don't know what's going on in Europe because it's not here. Uh, it's, it, it gets imported every now and then, but it doesn't hang around for very long. So the only way we can do it is by looking at what happens in its, in its wider areas, uh, primarily uh, Southeast Asia and South America. So that is essentially what we're doing. We're building models from those, how it spreads, how we can forecast it, which is more important, um, and then translating those to what goes on here. Uh, a lot of those models are based on water availability, hence the interest in water in Europe that I've just described, um, and we can use that to forecast. Key to these are both the reported cases of dengue, i.e. the, the um, disease itself, but also the covariate data suite, uh, data suite that drives the models. And here I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes, or last couple of minutes really, talking about Earth observation data, because there's a lot of it, as you all know. So somehow or other, we have to break it down into something that fits into these models without tearing our hair out and saying, which of the vast array of Earth observation data can we use for these models? So a lot of the things we do are data reduction, essentially. And we have now produced a product um, for uh, temperature, for various aspects of vegetation. Um, I'm sad to say from Modis and Veers rather than Copernicus, because it's got a longer time series we can look at. And we break it down uh, using Fourier processing, essentially, into synoptic uh, indicators of, disease, of um, levels, seasonality, and range variability over a certain, either three-year periods or 20-year periods. And that gives us a solid base to be able to make these sorts of forecasts. And because these are global data, we can use the same um, parameters to build our endemic models as for the ones that we're going to be using in uh, Europe. Import to the EU, well, basically what we do is we trace how many people are coming in from where we think the dengue hotspots are, which we can look at from the passenger lists on uh, aircraft. And then we uh, work out where those go in Europe and then look at the spread from those imported areas or likely spread using human mobility. And again, of course, climate drivers, which allows those spread. To give you an idea of how much these things can spread, you get the movement of 60,000 mosquitoes a day from Barcelona to Madrid in cars. You know, there you go. Right, that's a very rapid overflow, and I thought I might... Uh, thanks for listening. All of these people are very important in the project. Thank you for them. Um, I thought I might just leave a quick two-sentence thoughts about the use of EO in this thing. The tricky bit is finding the right one to use for us. Um, I'm, I've been working on it for a long time, but I had to persuade my colleagues to use Earth observation rather than um, we, uh, meteorological based stuff. Because they're not familiar with it, they don't understand it, they haven't seen much of it, they think it's very complicated, and they don't know which bits of it to use. So we, from the, in the EO community, we have a marketing problem to get it out into these sorts of use cases where they are, there aren't EEO specialists to use it. Now, I know this came up yesterday, but I think it's worth making, making a point of. 
If we don't get our act together, then it's going to be underused. Thank you very much. Thank you, William. I mean, very valid comment, and I, I hope that we would have the time to discuss it like we did yesterday. In any case, the next presentation is given by George Coutalieris, actually. This is the next uh, new project uh, linked to this group, and I'm very happy for this. It is the <coughs> project uh, Aqua Health. One Aqua Health. Aqua Health. Thank you, George. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Um, now, Onaqua Health also is part of the One Health Vision, a framework that tries to harmonize policies related to community health priorities, but harmonize with ecosystem health, animal and uh, biodiversity requirements. Let's see. It is evident to anyone, and it has been discussed many times during these days, that we did see a climatic, uh, let's say, behavior that is um, showing a radic, uh, rapid growth regarding the temperature, the global temperature. Another observation that was a motivation for this, uh, for this work is the rapid urbanization which is also very important if we consider that 70% of the global population is expected to live inside the urban environment by 2050. Now, getting to the point of the, as very well uh, noted by William, getting to the point of the European experts, uh, I feel really lucky to be wo working with uh, renowned experts in this uh, freshwater biodiversity, let's say, research, and indeed we are offering to them complementary capabilities. So, uh, although the project has started on January 2023, we are one-fifth in the course of the project. Still, we, work, we, we try to provide tools and new uh, capabilities to these researchers as I'm about to show you. But just to wrap up this slide, let me just uh, give you the basic observation is that freshwater species, one third of freshwater species is under extinction risk. We see that 50% of the rivers on a global scale are, be, are below the quality standards set by the experts. And then we see the urban stream syndrome, which is the basic motivation for us. And I think a very important motivation if we consider the urbanization issue discussed earlier and the impact on the large part of the population. So we saw altered flow regimes, low diversity alter alterations in the ecosystem, functioning and atypical seasonal patterns uh, with respect to the urban streams. So, this slide summarizes this, 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 this observation. We see a degraded urban freshwater eco ecosystems, and these are sources of diseases that affect both animals, plants, and humans. And human health is not only considered the physical health, but it, it's also the public welfare, the social welfare how we use these resources and how these resources are integrated using nature-based solution, which is a big part of the work that has been going on. I need to open this parenthesis. This is, this is only a glimpse to a specific dimension of this research, but there are other dimensions that are uh, in progress. So I need to say that the waterborne and vector-borne diseases, uh, public health and uh, social welfare are all related to the uh, urban aquatic ecosystems and of course they, are, uh, um, they depend on these climatic uh, uh, changes. Now what do we do in uh, one aqua health in this respect? The first is to assess the quality of the urban aquatic ecosystem and that is very important because I think for the first time um, we are trying to put together different disciplines in order to have a harmonized, let's say, uh, a viewpoint on how uh, we assess the quality of the, of, the, of the ecosystem. So how do you do that? How, how do we plan to do that? First, we identify the parameters related to the health of the freshwater ecosystem in urban context and uh, also to identify parameters related to human health and well-being and also to re-establish the balance between nature and humans. 
This is very important because it seems that the relationship works vice versa. If we improve the ecosystem, then the human, let's say, condition will improve and, and, it, and, and it goes also the other way. So, um, just to, to give a little glimpse on the project and to, to enter this, the, the, the territory of this discussion today, we have five sites to lose. Uh, Benveneto in Italy, Gent uh, in, uh, in uh, Belgium, Coimbra, Portugal, Norway. Um, and for, for, this, for these places, we plan to use uh, Galileo Sentinel-2 data, uh, specifically as we see uh, in the following uh, surface reflectance, seems to work really well for us, but lower orbit data is something we are also considering. So this will come in, let's say, uh, co we, com we try to combine different available contexts. Uh, the reason for that, let me go. The reason for that is that the streams, as we realized, are really narrow. We are talking about five meters, even less, three meters in width. So the area that they are, the, 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 these researchers are monitoring is not only in the urban environment, it's, it's really narrow. So we need to find ways to accommodate that. Now, in situ data, there is in-test data collection, because this is what these teams are doing. Of course, as William again, you mentioned earlier, these guys are not used to, you, to, the, to, to, to the available, let's say, EO uh, tools, but they know their work, and this, their work is to record habitats of these ecosystems, to uh, identify chemical pollutants or other pollutants in the stream, or even to count the species and the taxa, different taxa of, of ecology that uh, resides in these areas. And they do it around the clock, day to day. So what is this discussion about today? Our aim is to correlate actually the ground data with the work that they, they have been that has been going on in their research topic, and this is something that we need to go really deep. So uh, we need to consider. I will not go into detail. The the, the, the presentation will be online, uh, but we need to consider multi-spectral capabilities of the Galileo, and to see whether available uh, indicators could could work. So. How do we go about it? We need to enter a discussion with the researchers and come up with some candidate indicators that, that they feel could complement their domain of expertise. And vegetation indices like NDVI, urbanization indices like built up, and uh, water indices like uh, NDWI are, let's say, some uh, priorities that have been identified. So, for example, in the case of Ghent, we used, let's say, uh, some experiments with NDVI and GVMI in order to identify a very important characteristic with the generation of algae in these uh, in these uh, sites. Now, of course. The sampling continues, so we need to establish a methodology for data collection on site. So why do we need this data on these different sites? First of all, we have to correlate the data with specific areas. So I think this is an important, let's say, identification, observation. We need tools. We need annotation tools. One minute. Annotation tools to provide to the experts. This is, for us, the only way to engage them in, let's say, to work with the satellite data. And then, of course, there are challenges. The challenges in the areas of interest, as I have I told you earlier, is there is the image resolution limitation, obstructed view of the urban structures, very important limitation. And of course, the dense vegetation, which is also an issue in, in, in these places. Um, of course, this is something that, that most of you are familiar, but it's good to demonstrate that these uh, indicators cannot work unless some level of resolution is achieved. So we, we see an example, the, the example in C, that 
does not provide any information, whereas in example in B, uh, it worked indeed for us. So priorities for us, the next period is first to collect uh, diverse data sets from its pilot sites. This include ecological quality, biological quality, riparian integrity, hydromorphological quality, water quality. So these are the European experts working uh, with us. Then we need to correlate these ground measures to develop a prediction model for streams health assessment. And then we want to validate the, this model in different sites in order to improve the accuracy. This standard work, I will put the teams there because I need to say this would not be possible without the help of uh, Maria Feo and her team in University of Coimbra. Hence, her name in the presentation, but I'm really happy to receive her trust in giving this presentation. Thank you all for your kind questions. Thank you, George. The next uh, presentation is given by Alexia. Alexia is uh, <clears throat> going to give a presentation about an initiative, a coordination and support action, the GeoCred. GeoCred was a precursor action of uh, EuroG or ESAP, if I may use. And uh, since then, Euro, uh, GeoCred became a geo initiative. The main scope is to disseminate and communicate the actions being developed in the framework of uh, Geo or Eurogeo in uh, regions outside Europe, I mean in uh, North Africa, Middle East, Balkans. So, Alexia, please take the floor and explain how a coordination and support action could be used uh, in parallel to the implementation action so as to support one another. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the Thank you. Department. Indeed, uh, it started as a coordination and support action back in uh, 2016, and uh, I will briefly summarize the way until it became a geo initiative. Uh, in the meantime, it uh, was upgraded to a community activity and uh, from the 2018 in Kyoto the decision was taken to to be upgraded also to a geo initiative so this is the uh, state of the art uh, earth observation activities that was the focus and uh, actually the scope was to integrate and to coordinate all these uh, uh, different activities in different countries in this uh, challenging area of uh, Balkans North Africa Middle East and uh, what uh, now is uh, expanded uh, in uh, terms of uh, both uh, geographically and uh, uh, as, a, as also thematic areas uh, we will see in the geo initiative uh, what extra things we have included and and uh, here is the nutshell, first of all, of the GeoCrad laser project. So four pilot activities were uh, implemented uh, related to climate change, to food security and uh, water extremes management, raw materials and uh, solar energy. And uh, a part of these four feasibility studies, uh, some central horizontal actions uh, were implemented, uh, like a regional data hub, which uh, facilitated the access and search and share of Earth observation data, and actually contribute them to the geos, to the system. So another, uh, uh, another highlight was the regional networking platform, which is continuously uh, enriched. And it was very interesting to see after each capacity action that we were doing, uh, more people were existing, more partners were existing, more organizations and uh, this was proven to be a very good platform also to develop synergies for common activities, for uh, uh, to, to form a consortia for projects in the, in the future. So uh, last one was uh, the Earth Observation Maturity Indicators methodology, another important deliverable and another uh, important uh, methodology that was applied and it produced countries' Earth Observation profiles, which you could see the maturity in different levels and uh, this uh, all together of uh, all these uh, outcomes of the GeoCradle, uh, they were the basis and uh, also the experience of uh, our capacity building actions in these areas that uh, uh, we put them together and we produced a roadmap for this area specific for the future implementation of GEOS and Copernicus in this region of interest. What did I do? Ah, okay, so uh, then for the expansion under the GEO initiative, we have uh, also included the Black Sea as a geographical expansion and uh, in thematically we have uh, two themes uh, in addition, disaster management and water resources management. And uh, as for the pilots, we continue uh, pushing for their operationalization of services to the engaged users. And this indeed was uh, made possible already through the shape uh, project for
for example, where we managed to, to integrate these pilots and to make them even more advanced and to develop more services and to make them more operationalizations. Uh, and uh, also that uh, Dr. Kodais already mentioned, the EWA, which was an onboarded pilot also to the shape and uh, then also thanks to the, to the Horizon Prize of the European Innovation Council, uh, this allowed also further development. And uh, finally, the Excelsior project is a Horizon 2020 teaming phase uh, two project. And you can see here, I will not uh, mention all of them, but uh, you can see here the variety of stakeholders and end users that uh, they came out of the GeoCradle initiative and that uh, they, they spread in all the, in all the spectrum of uh, end users from a uh, private to public sector from academia from uh, all the decision makers and in different fields like you can see in the solar energy we have uh, ministries of environment and energy for example in egypt we have private investments for solar parks uh, for uh, the agriculture we have also engaged and we have uh, co uh, close cooperation with the insurance companies and uh, also, this was uh, also uh, taken upon by the cooperatives, farmers' cooperatives in the eShape project were uh, interested in this um, service and with the co-design methodology we further developed specific uh, services for their daily practices. Uh, then we have the disasters of course, floods and uh, geohazards and volcanicas that uh, there were, uh, we had even interest of the volcanicas and uh, uh, advisory centers and the aviation industry because it's influencing the flights of course. And uh, for the, uh, for the, I will not um, enter in the details for the early warning system for mosquito-borne diseases. We had already a presentation, and uh, let's go on now to the concrete outcomes and impact. So we have all this regional uh, cooperation now and uh, liaison with the initiatives of Copernicus, EuroGeo, AfriGeo, and uh, ESA-Geo. We have also uh, contacts, and uh, we've, we've make this possible in the UN Spider Framework because we are regional support office as a, the beyond of National Observatory of Athens. And uh, we are also uh, disseminating this and we make synergies in the CEOs working group of disasters risk reduction. Here you can see also different uh, uh, congresses and different opportunities that we have already uh, made uh, with the with, uh, uh, cooperation of others. Like for example, in the Albania, we made the specific workshops following the contacts that we had established in the GeoCradle, and uh, we will also come back for the upcoming actions uh, also in the Geo Week, also for the FP Cup uh, that the Copernicus uh, uptake is, uh, is very important because it's funding some of uh, the basic uh, you know, travel expenses that we need to do in order to reach all these uh, partners. And uh, so this uh, contributes to the impact maximization. Uh, and the, and uh, like this, we, we make you know, this scalability and transferability that it's uh, one of the main purposes. And this is the final slide uh, for the evaluation, reflection, and lessons learned. So what we have seen is that uh, the, there is a big uh, legacy, there is an impact already recognized. The pilots have increased their TRL during all this uh, process and all this uh, integration in the running projects and also by the award, by the Horizon Prize, the Earth Observation Maturity Assessment is further developed and implemented. Uh, actually, I was speaking with uh, Lefteris from Evenflow. They are still uh, expanding and include new countries. Now they are going to Sub-Saharan for six countries. They will also implement this methodology that was further enhanced in the Shape project. So we do all this um, so also on a voluntary basis but uh, also with the projects that are coming and uh, of course more sustainable funding should be a, a real facilitator in order to have some more stable you know and some better uh, planning of, uh, of this uh, work and uh, now for the secretariats also both uh, GEO and EuroGEO secretariats uh, would help for a better liaison uh, in order to have uh, better cooperation in the framework of EuroGEO and AfriGEO. So thank you for your attention and we can pass to you. Thank you Alexia, I understand that it's very difficult to speak in seven minutes.
with such an action, but anyway. Okay, let's proceed with the last presentation of the day. It's given by Ms. Julie Letertre. Uh, I think Ms. Letertre is going to be connected virtually, right? Uh, do we have Ms. Letertre with us? Yes. Yes, hello, can you hear okay. me? Thank you, yes, we can hear you. Please, go on. Yes, thank you very much. I'm apologizing, I couldn't stay longer. Uh, I was there yesterday, but today I had to go back for personal reason. So I have to give my presentation uh, online, so sorry about that. So Alexia, can you share my presentation? Please? If one moment, please. Could, could you please uh, yeah, play this later. One moment, please, to fix the presentation so as to be available to us. It's okay now, you can continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, the Copernicus project uh, has been running now since several years. And uh, at Copernicus, the first uh, objective was to collect some Earth data observation that has a purpose uh, to give information for European countries. And uh, that was the main goal of the first uh, period of Copernicus. With the second phase of Copernicus, it started to be more driven around, around the users. And we started to develop some new projects like the National Collaboration Action and the thematic hubs. So the Copernicus services, the uh, segment, the, are starting to pair up with the countries to have national, national action and are pairing up with uh, thematic hubs to have really dedicated uh, information uh, for a specific sector, for specific countries. So it's really what we try to achieve uh, in this new phase of Copernicus. So as I said, we have three new, uh, two new tools. So one of them is the Semantic Hubs. So what is a Semantic Hubs is defined in our agreement as a single entry point for a se specific sector that can backtrack to EU policy needs and have a simplified access uh, to the data. So at ECMWF, you have been mandated to do the health hub and the energy hub. So the energy hub will be presented this afternoon by, uh, by Fabio, who is in the room today with you. And I will present the health now. So what, what we want to achieve with having this data is having technical knowledge and expertise from the Copernicus point of view. Give, uh, in, give an example, for example, of how this data can be used and integrated for the specific sector. Be inspiring, improve coordination, make more collaboration and integration between organization and member states, and give guide, guidance and capacity building. So that is really what we try to achieve with these different hubs. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, uh, oops. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, what happened uh, is in June last year, uh, for the Health Hub, we've been mandated by uh, DG Davis to start to work uh, on the Health Hub and try to define how we can collect information for the health sector. Then, a few months later, we've been mandated by the Energy Hub. One year later, uh, we started to have what we call the pre-launch. So we've launched uh, the access to the website and catalog uh, for the health hub and then for the energy hub. In few weeks time, we will have the formal launch by uh, the European Commission during the EU Space Weeks. Uh, so on the 7th of November, we will be the official launch. All, all the hubs have been developed so far for Copernicus, meaning the health and the energy one, but also the coastal and the Arctic. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to do the health hub, it, it's not an easy task. We were talking about it yesterday. 
because what we needed to do is to collect information what is existing in Copernicus that's related to health, how and to and, and it identify which are the information and how they can be used. And you can realize that sometimes some information uh, are straightforward, useful, but sometimes they are a little bit more hidden, but can be used. The so question is, should we use, should we provide access to raw data? Should we provide access to more advanced data? So what we have decided to do, because the hubs are not really funded by themselves, so we've decided to go for the raw data as a first thing. So we have data from UMETAT and ESA, from the institute component, and from all the services. So when we collected all this data, we also tried to see um, how the user can use them. So we decided to create an advisory board using people from more of uh, the health sector, like people from Digi Santé, Lancet Goodburn, EAA with the Health Observatory, and WHO, WMO, uh, Europe uh, sector. With all of them, we decided to find how we could uh, build together and propose something that's useful for the community. So our main, user, our main goal is to be useful. And it's really, uh, as discussed yesterday, it's really something difficult to do. Next slide, please. So what we need to understand is the three different level uh, of things we have to do. First, we need to identify who are the users. So in the health sector, in the health hub, we want to reach health sector, but who are the, the health sector communities that can be the core user of Copernicus, like, uh, like DG, DGs at the European Commission or uh, national authorities, mayor of city, but it can also be citizen or it can be application developer. The second question was mentioned yesterday is what the user wants. What they want to have access as a data. So as I said earlier, do they want raw data? Do they want more advanced indicator and other things? And the third thing is why? Why do they need it? Why do they want to have access to the data? And that was mentioned uh, yesterday again of try to understand what is a part of the journey they want to achieve. Next slide, please. So here is what we have developed so far. So we have a web page, which is more or less containing a lot of user stories, a lot of um, inspiring information, like why health is related to uh, environment and climate uh, and things like that. So it's a much more a reading point of view. The second one is a catalog. It's an access to some database. So as it's still in development, you can see this is written on the page that is still in development. For the moment, the database containing in it is quite small, but uh, is, pro is improving and growing uh, day after day. Next slide. So for example, I was saying that we have use cases, user stories, so what, that is just one, and it was just to show you what uh, we can find. So under the use cases, you can have different thematic. One of the thematic is heat and sun related use cases. One of them is hair quality, climate change, and public health. In this, in this uh, domain, you can find different uh, uh, in application coming from different a service of uh, Copernicus. So this one was com contributing camps and CTS. And you can see how Copernicus data can be used for health purpose. Next slide, please. So the next step is to go further. So as I said, for the moment, we're using raw data. We're using uh, our data provided by the service. Uh, we're using user stories that's already existing. But what we would like to go is to go a little bit further, have new indicator, more user story, more use cases. And also we would like to work more with the project partner. So like, for example, we are developing in-house a trigger and AD for GD. We are contributing to these two projects. So they will be now integrated to uh, the, the thematic hubs. But we would like to go further and have a, be also a, a kind of a point of access to different projects and to different indicators that can be developed in the health purpose. 
we would like to continue to work with uh, interested, uh, interested entities and European Commission to try to see forward how we can provide a better access uh, as to the health community towards the environment and the climate data. And finally, what we would like to do is to reach new stakeholders, have a better engagement with users and stakeholders, and go a little bit further on the understanding, uh, on building the bridge on between uh, climate, uh, environment, scientists, and health sector. And with that, I think it's my last. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Okay, dear colleagues, we run out of time, but I would kindly ask uh, uh, you to take five or, if you want, minutes from the coffee break, so as to have some discussion, some, I mean, if possible, to summarize. It's important for us. I mean, two days now, yesterday and today, we had a very interesting I mean, discussion at the same time, presentation of different actions that have been, some of them done under the flag of Eurogeo, some others are new. But you, you are linking to Eurogeo and to this action group, and I'm very happy seeing that because, I mean, <clears throat> whatever we are discussing and all the terms we are using, either the ones being involved in the Eurogeo action for the last four or five years, or the newcomers actually who are using the same terms, who are using the term of data harmonization of data, data repository, exploitation of data platforms, user engagement, stakeholder engagement, and I mean, what is important for us, I mean, to consider today that this action group, if we say this is an action group, I would prefer to use the term for, is, is uh, where we can meet, exchange, and see what is the level of collaboration and support we, we can receive one another. I mean, from the different point of view, we may have this being out of five, actually. Scientists, service providers, I mean, all of us were scientists, but anyway, we're such as service providers or uh, even I mean, end users or stakeholders. So, I would like directly to ask all of you after these two days of discussions we had, and of course, uh, excellent presentations <coughs> we had. What do you think? I mean, the members or the former members of action group that have uh, been part of the implementation through the ESAPE Eurogeo project or other projects that I mean uh, were I mean to some extent bringing the flag of Eurogeo what do you think has been for you useful beneficial of being part of Eurogeo what actually Eurogeo has done so as to support your action so far, your implementation. And uh, even more, what do you expect in terms of coordination so as your action to become, uh, I mean, more sustainable? What do you think is sustainability for you? And what the, is the coordination and support you may need from Eurogeo uh, in order that your action becomes, I mean, uh, it's sustained. And from the ones that are <coughs> coming recently into this uh, type of discussions into the, in this forum, uh, what do you, how do you feel actually being part of this community? What is for you the useful? What is beneficial? And what do you expect from this community, from this initiative? Other the name of Eurogeo to be, I mean, uh, uh, taken as an action source to support your activity. So, who wants to take the role? Either from the partners that have been part of the Eurogeo and this action group, or the newcomers. Who wants to take the floor? Make any comment from the group. Please. Thank you, Harris, for the nice introduction. As a newcomer myself, I need to uh, attest that uh, there is this rapport and support, uh, but at a personal level. We get to know people that are working on similar problems 
And as, as I said yesterday, we have the impression that we work alone in silos in the projects. And when we get to these meetings, we realize that we are, everyone is trying to solve the same problem. I really like, uh, for example, William, I feel that I'm offering new capabilities to researchers and opening new opportunities with AI, with observation data and all these things. It's, this is an important achievement and I think this is something that these uh, projects and the forum has to offer. So, if I may summarize two things, first of all, we need to engage the actual domain experts in a way. This means that we need to come up with, let's say, some offerings to them. To me, I believe we need to give them tools to use the technology. Really simple tools like this uh, uh, geojation annotation is, a, is an amazing opportunity to engage them directly. So offering them the tools would be something that EuroG will be really proud of because it will be for an outside community. Uh, I'm also a newcomer and hadn't really heard much of this. I, initially, it, it struck me that Eurogeo was a, center, uh, was a supply side thing. It was talking about how to supply, how to organize it, how to standardize it, how to bureau bureaucratize it, all these other things, uh, where the funding came from, who provided it, how it was organized, what the initiatives were. It seems to me that actually today we've had more examples of, of users and provided perhaps um, an impetus for that supply side con uh, constant focus to move more to the demand side. Um, because it's clear that people now understand the potential of using these data that we provide. It's not quite so clear that people are all that keen on yet doing it or know how to do it or know where to get it from or any of these other things. It's fine if you've been in the profession for a long time. It's great to see the move, but I think it's possibly now time to focus on uh, how we, I mean, we've heard a lot of it, user needs and all the rest of it, but how we then implement the change in focus from organization of supply to satisfying demand. I think that is something that we need to start as you broaden the community, because not everybody's supplying. That's relatively a lot more people that could be using it. Thank you. Thank you, William. Please. Uh, thank you. Um, so one thing uh, I, I would like to say that is um, it would be good uh, to to uh, uh, have some synergies also with the Copernicus thematic hubs. Uh, because it's uh, obviously both in in uh, in uh, Eurogeo and and Copernicus, you know, the, the involvement of of the European Commission is 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 big. So that it would be good to 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 have this coordination, and uh, um, and yeah, I, I would like also to say that perhaps from the point of view of the organization of of, of events, and uh, um, it would be nice to see a continuation of the communication in between workshops, in between these events that happen, you know, twice a, a year. And that could be done via newsletters, I don't know, blogs, uh, where people can showcase also their, 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 their developments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more comments? Marco, please. Thanks, Aris. I think I appreciate very much this initiative, first for the personal contact and communication that this kind of initiative brings to, with, with itself. Second, I, I was reflecting, so a key questions that is how we, a community like this, may um, promote the use of data getting from a satellite. I am always, I'm, I worked always in a, in a layer that is on the boundary between data production, data use, and the operative works. Because I worked as an engineering in uh, my polytechnics, but also in my company. So I, uh, I am stressed somehow, and this is my personal experience, sometimes by the data and their own reliability. I think this probably is an issue and a community like this one, this is just a, a brainstorm, so please, I'm um, just uh, loudly thinking, and a community like this one may maybe provide a kind of uh, 
discussion about this type, what kind, this data, with, with this kind of data we can can be used for, until which level, and also provide some uh, additional information, maybe to Copernicus, that means to space agency, how, where would they have to improve the data accuracy? Because uh, what that means, we have a, 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 an accuracy of two or three degrees on land surface temperatures. How this impact, for instance, on our on the monitoring and the monitoring of our uh, 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 actual evapotranspiration? It is a big impact or not? About soil moisture, we can discuss at the same time for a while. What is the impact also on a simple products like NDVI on uh, uh, plant uh, uh, parameterization still for the use? I know these fields in the fields of uh, uh, crop resistance, for instance, the crop uh, and like NDVI, like leaf area index. How, how they, the accuracy of data will impact on that? I, I think if we will, it is not an easy job is a, is a job but i think a community of this one because there are a lot of experts in different branch may try to provide a, a kind of um, uh, accuracy request or accuracy statement on on this type of data grazie <clears throat> thank you marco i mean on one side is uh, science innovation and what does impact actually uh, on the daily practice, on the level of information and the knowledge we, we can deliver to the end user. This is very important for this community first to understand that we are not just scientists processing data or developing models. We have to have through what we are producing actually to address the need of the user. And what uh, William said is that we have to see, I mean, the demand okay, side of, uh, of uh, our action actually and this is very very important and that was the main and the key aspect when we initiated five years ago actually with Eurogeo you remember you you are are one of the older members I mean of this action group that we wanted to be I mean once again one project that ends and nobody Again, I mean, it's taking care of it, but we wanted to have an action which is sustainable and which has to have, I mean, a follow up project or implementation or a continuation into the user engagement. And that is what we discussed yesterday. The engagement of user is not a simple story. For scientists, it's simpler to develop models or to improve the accuracy. But when you, we want to communicate that to the end user and you want the users being, I mean, engaged and co-create, co-develop with all of us the product which is necessary for daily, daily practice. This is a time consuming process and the scientists should have, be adapted into that. So this is Eurogeo. This is the concept of Eurogeo. And of course, the coordination is very important and the continuation of this type of discussions and meetings and workshops. It's what <clears throat> Eurogeo wants actually to establish for the future, together with the implementation action, to, to be, I mean, aside the so-called coordination action, uh, which, I don't know, it, according to the Commission, I mean, it is going to be undertaken as an action by the so-called Eurogeo Secretariat. It's a body that it is to be established in the in the very near future, but at the same time, we have to sub be supported and to use all the other coordination and support actions already running, Copernicus FPCAP or GeoCreative Initiative, because I mean, all of them are already there. Of course, the Euro Geo Secretariat will collaborate with all these different actions. Copernicus hubs. Copernicus is developing hubs of data. Eurogeo is seeking to develop data repositories, harmonized data sets, not only Earth observation data, but also in situ data, sensor data, and this to be freely available and open to the scientists and to the end users. So we have to coordinate all that so as not to run in different, you know, 
ways, but to converge all these actions into a common European uh, action development uh, initiative, like the Eurogeo initiative. I still <coughs> be optimist. Five years ago, we were, I mean, in a rather fragmented, like we presented, environment, developing things. Now, through the Eurogeo initiative, we have the feeling that we started at least the discussions in the community converging into one concept. Let's see how far we can go. Any more comment, please? Erwin, please. It's not a comment, Harris, but um, I think we need to close here because lunch is served and within half an hour the e poster sessions will start again. Uh, just to say that um, the suggestions that you made are excellent. As Harris said, we will announce tomorrow the new Eurogia Secretariat starting soon, 1st of December. So please, the practical input that you all have uh, on the use new set, for example, how to keep the, the dialogue ongoing, please put them on the posts that are on the foyer upstairs. Please do it, huh? that we take them in the discussions tomorrow. Also, I saw a lot of relevant things for the next Eurogeo, for the next Geo, Geo Ministerial in Cape Town. So there's also this um, expression of interest that we sent last Wednesday. So if you want to show a poster there, you can just send it. We will make sure that we have an European Commission boot, European Union boot, I should say. You can put your poster there for your projects, mature things, but also projects that just started. Uh, if you have a video with subtitles, we can also use it. If you are there in Cape Town and you want to have a, a, a discussion at our EU booth, please mention this, but fill in the form that we sent last Wednesday, today, the latest tomorrow, that's important. And I need to uh, also for, of course, the online people like Alexia, for example, uh, what you do, the other Alexia, I mean, <laughs> uh, also take, uh, take advantage of this. And for this, I would like to, to thank Alexia and you, Harris, for this excellent session. Sorry to be the, the break of the discussion, but I think there's excellent food outside, so I give you, Harris, the last word to, to close the session. Okay, no, thank you very much. Thank you, dear colleagues. We'll continue. We'll continue. Thank you. Thank you very much.